Okay, yeah. So sorry for the delay. Uh, we are just, uh, I'm the first to talk, so we are just finishing the setup of the video to do the recording. There is actually no audio coming out, so if you can't hear me, just raise your hand and uh, I will raise my voice. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about Enlightenment Foundation Library. Uh, I am Cédric Bay. Uh, I am working now for a Samsung uh, open source group. Uh, I am working for the American branch, but actually directly in my home net. Uh, I have been working on Enlightenment since 2005 and for Samsung maybe since three or four years now. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about what are the Enlightenment Foundation Library, uh, where they are used. Uh, that is mostly uh, concerning where Samsung is using them right now. And also what are the current plan of uh, the community and also uh, uh, Samsung on how we are going to improve uh, ESL and Enlightenment uh, in the coming year. Uh, and also for question, uh, we will be a little bit short on time, so I may speak fast. If you have question, maybe keep them for the end. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to make it in time. Uh, so, what is ESL? So, ESL is actually a toolkit that was created for Enlightenment 17. So, if you didn't hear about Enlightenment 17, it was like with me came forever. It took like 10 years to make it. And the main reason was because we did write a full toolkit before writing Enlightenment. So, it used right now, uh, uh, so it's a window manager, Enlightenment. It also did become a composite manager. It started in 96. Uh, seven. It was actually the first window manager of the GNOME project, but there was a disagreement between uh, the leader of Enlightenment and the GNOME leader at the time, and they took part away. So we started to do a full rewrite in 2001, and we did the first review of Enlightenment in 2011, actually, uh, 2012, uh, in December. Uh, the very first and very important belief in the Enlightenment community is actually to uh, that there will be no year of the Linux desktop. Uh, we we have built from the beginning by thinking that we should be targeting the embedded world uh, because we were thinking that where there will be a market to have nice UI, reactive UI, and to have something where it was not at the time existing. Uh, well, I think we were right. We just didn't make it in time, I guess. <laughs> uh, so we needed a toolkit for that. I will explain later why. Uh, so Enlightenment 17 was the version number. Uh, we are right now at Enlightenment 19 and we basically just call it Enlightenment. Uh, so en Enlightenment itself is no different from any other uh, application. It is using EFL main loop, it is using EFL string wrap. Which basically means that the we, we did create a toolkit for a window manager, but the tool toolkit can be used for any kind of application. And uh, that is basically also why it took so much time, in fact. So we have now a Wayland client support in Enlightenment in the latest release. So if you have a Wayland application, you can run in Enlightenment already. And uh, we are working right now on adding uh, TMS DRM uh, Enlightenment, so that you don't need X11 uh, to run Enlightenment and have a full uh, Wayland experience, basically. Uh, one of the main thing when you're doing embedded device is that you want to have a configuration that is very specific for your device. You don't want to have, for example, a shelf uh, if, you are if you are on a phone. You just want to have this stop bar or this like, uh, gadget for battery for the radio signal and stuff. So you want to have a very uh, different set of module, of theme, and all kind of uh, um, profile, actually, for Enlightenment. So Enlightenment.stream has currently two profiles. It has a uh, normal desktop, which is what basically most people know as a desktop, and we have also a timing profile. Uh, Samsung does have some internally uh, some profiles for uh, TV and for uh, phone. And uh, other company have also some tablet profile for Enlightenment. And we are trying to actually push this profile upstream, but it takes a little bit of time to make gen them generic and not product specific, in fact. Uh, 
as a community on Lightning. It's uh, maybe uh, around 60 unique contributors to our uh, ESL release. So we do now a release every three months. Uh, and the core contributor is around 10 people. So it's, it's very small as a developer team, uh, in fact. Uh, we have actually no real link with the user base because they are using distribution. So we, do, we don't know how many people are actually using e uh, on Lightning and ESL. What we know is the people that are using all Git. So we know that people are mostly daily drilling uh, on Lightning. It's 1,000 people. We don't really know for what purpose or anything, but that's basically the what we, we know. We have two big distribution, which is Body and Elive. But as I say, we don't really know uh, the user, and that's kind of disconnected. Uh, so when I talk about the Enlightenment community, I mostly talk about the developer and the people that are involved in the process of building ESL and Enlightenment and application around uh, ESL. Uh, so for that purpose, it's mostly people that really want to have some optimized stuff uh, that are working on mostly constrained hardware, be it desktop or embedded device. And this means that uh, for Enlightenment ESL and most product around the ESL community, we really focus on having uh, something fast. When we say light, it's light in terms of memory usage. We do actually uh, do a lot of benchmark on uh, memory, battery and power consumption. Uh, we also, uh, we also due to all the configuration of hardware and scenario that people are using it, we need to have a lot of feature of functionality that you can turn on and off, which is sometimes a nightmare. And of course, we need to have customization and also scalability because uh, scalability in two parts for the, the CPU itself, where we want to be able to use the CPU, multi-core GPU when you have them. And we also need to handle screen that have very various resolution. You want to scale from uh, like a, f a watch to a 4K TV. So you, you need to, s to be able to do all the range of visual with the same toolkit. Uh, so it took us like a decade to write uh, ESL. Uh, it's I think that the first release of ESL was in 2011, something like that. Uh, it's a mix of LGPL and BSD. Mostly the BSD is for the part that you think are uh, OS specific, uh, because when you port ESL to a system where you don't really uh, like proprietary OS, you don't really care about code patch uh, to do the uh, to do the compilation of your proprietary OS because we are not going to have access to your OS anyway. So you can just skip them and we don't bother. Uh, but we care about the LGPL part, the common part, so the widget, all the things that work everywhere. We actually do care about them, and we want the patch back, basically. We have a stable API and long-term support for ESL. The goal is to not break application. Uh, that's something very important. For Even for when we do uh, change the team, we make sure that we are still uh, compatible for application, that we don't break application. Uh, because we are doing a very fast release cycle, we do a three-month release cycle, we, we are really going that fast. The main reason is because uh, Samsung also do a lot of product, and the development of product is very quick also, and they want the latest feature, but sometimes some feature are missing, so they want to be able to add the feature, have a stable release done, and then be able to do a product very quickly in the same uh, kind of uh, way. So this way we are always close to a release when they do a product. Uh, so, yeah, as I say, it was done for window manager, but you can do uh, any application. The main reason why we did it is because of the scene graph. Uh, I will later on explain what is a scene graph and what it d why it does matter that much to us. Uh, but basically, the core reason was because there was, in 2001, there was no scene graph on any open source library. To this day, most scene graphs are still very limited. Uh, I mean, some toolkit like Jupyter still don't have any scene graph. Uh, and Scoot has it only if you use Scoot it Scoot. So very, there is really not that much uh, toolkit that does answer or need on that side. Uh, ESL, we do constantly do benchmark. Uh, we also have device to check power consumption, so we also do check power consumption at Samsung of every release of ESL. So we are pretty sure that uh, when we do a new release, it is at least as good as the previous one in terms of battery, memory, and uh, CPU usage. Uh, 
So that's part of the release process, actually. Or we do, I mean, we do device for all around the world. So basically, we do also care about our um, uh, internationalization, which also means that we need to be able to do uh, right to left and left to right um, uh, language. We need to have full U2SA support and stuff like that. It's kind of obvious these days, but we need to stay to say it at least. Uh, also, we have introduced uh, a concept of sales cycle because um, GPI doesn't help us. Uh, because we do devices that are like a watch and that has a GPI that is the same as the TV. It's just that the resolution, the, the distance of reading is very different. One is like 30 centimeters from your face and the other one is like two meters away. So we have this notion of scale factor that affects all your rendering. Um, that is a way to change your layout, to change uh, your font size, all the readable element on screen in a meaningful way for your actual reading distance. So basically what we call a scale factor is uh, a way to measure the reading distance of every component. Uh, we do have yeah, profile support, same, same as I do. That, yeah. uh, we, have, uh, we can build PFL into static library and pack everything into one binary. And the minimal uh, today uh, binary we can do with all dependency is eight megabytes. Uh, it did tend to go a little bit up in the past year or two because nobody to the same time to think that more. Uh, with eight megabytes, you basically fit in all the device we have. If you are, you want more things, you can still do that, but you won't spend more time than that. Uh, so why do we care still about optimization? I mean, uh, in 2015, we could have Moore's law helping us. It could be like 20. But no, because we do a lot of devices that are on battery, and battery don't work more slow. On the best scenario, we have like 10% more battery life uh, due to one year to the other. So you need to have a lot of optimization to actually uh, gain battery. Uh, same thing with memory boundaries. Memory boundaries don't call more slow. It's, uh, it's actually getting worse and worse because your CPU core is getting better and your memory is not in terms of memory boundaries. So your CPU is going to be idle and idle more and more. So the way you use your CPU and you don't store on memory usage is very important because you don't, if you are storing, you are actually uh, using battery for doing nothing useful at all. So it's very important to do optimization for all devices that are running on battery, basically. Another uh, reason uh, is uh, that we are actually targeting devices that are very cheap uh, system entry. Uh, when we are talking about um, a low-end low phone, which is still a high-end system on chip when you compare to what you can put into a dishwasher or oven or anything like that, because the price of an oven is actually very close to the price of a low-end phone. So you can't make the same hardware in both of them. So for that reason, we still have the need to have a software uh, uh, render that is very fast and able to run at the low end uh, with no trouble. That's something also that's important to actually something like that. Uh, we yeah, also many of the rendering operations are limited by bandwidth. I will come to that a little bit later again. Uh, and yeah, one of the last thing is that when you are doing multitasking on, uh, on a low end phone, you actually, have out of memory that will be gone by the web browser. That thing is going to exceed like 500 megabytes. And then you are, you really still want to have your application running in parallel. And if you start to use OpenGL, most drivers will consume like 40 megabytes for GL context. So your memory is vanishing very quickly. And if you need to have GL context, one GL context per application, like you need, a, do you need G OpenGL to draw a calculator? No, you don't. So this kind of application that are very small and don't really need hardware can run perfectly well on software and actually save battery also because you don't power up an, a GPU that, yeah, that doesn't do anything useful. So right now, that's why we have a fully working software rendering and that is something that we are going to stick with. So we have both OpenGL and software for good reason. I, yeah, uh, you can keep, yeah, that's there. Uh, enlightenment, yeah, EFL run, uh, application run. Uh, also something that is interesting is that most hardware we see 
have the same kind of trade-off between a string size, CPU, and memory bandwidth. So it also means that your application is going to be basically linked directly to the string size. Or uh, the more pieces you have to push, the, more the bigger the CPU you need to be, the more memory you need to have, and so on. The more flash you need to, to, uh, to have. It's kind of obvious to say it, but that's the main driving factor in terms of uh, requirement on your, your system. Uh, yeah, we, we can do actually a desktop with 48 megabytes of RAM and 300 megahertz on a tw uh, 10, uh, 24 and 1200 uh, screen. So yeah, that's our desktop profile. So you can imagine that if you don't do a desktop, you can do away having that. So TFL, uh, how does that work? So that's a little bit of uh, like everything on it. Uh, the main component uh, that is the most interesting one is AVAST. I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, in length about it. Uh, and uh, we have a bunch of other useful library uh, that are cool to, because we are doing C. So we don't have, for example, any linked list or stuff like that. So we have ANA, which is a toolbox for all the data types. We have EEP for serialization and stuff like that. We have pre-desktop, we have a, a data description language, which is Android. Edge, which is our Sim uh, library, and Elementor, which is our uh, widget set. So everything is built on each other. So uh, we, we basically, you can build uh, a full application by just relying on ESL. You don't need to use any other toolkit. That's the goal of ESL. So EEP is something that is very specific to ESL, so that's why I'm going to just talk a little bit about it. Uh, the idea behind EEP is uh, that you can serialize any key structure in memory directly into a file, and when you need it back, you can just get it directly into the key structure. You don't actually need to go to a readable um, file, which makes the parsing much more faster, and we actually can uh, are able to map part of the file directly in memory. So there is even the kernel helping to just get that very fast memory, and it makes sense because most of the time it's not a human that is going to read your configuration, that is going to read your sim, or your layout. All of that is basically going to be read 99% of the time by your computer. So when you actually need to read that, we have a tool to, to actually make that key structure into a text file. So if you really need to read it, you can to see it by uh, human eyes, you can. But that's not the main use case. The main use case is to be as fast as possible in memory when you are reading it, because that's mostly what we are doing. It provides, yeah, uh, it also works over network, so you can send actually the same key structure from one side to the other with no headache. That's very, very neat. We, can, we actually use this EP to store all SIM, so that means we have image, font, uh, sound in it. Uh, and uh, it's yeah, it's really designed to pack everything to one file. It's kind of what the game are doing usually, is to have this kind of uh, pack file where you have all your resource to not go all around the disk and have a very fast uh, time to, 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 do, to parse. Uh, yeah, we did put your configuration and all sim uh, inside uh, this, uh, with this EEP file. So the core, the core of the of uh, ESL is Avast. It's a sim graph. So it's uh, we we did our own sim graph uh, because it didn't exist at the time. We have now more than ten years of optimization in it. It starts to be actually difficult to do uh, any kind of major rework because of all the optimization we have. We uh, when you change it, we have impact on performance everywhere. So it's really uh, already in a very good state of performance, and there is very little gain we can we have right now on that. But we still have a few ideas to try there. Uh, the goal of the sim graph is to reduce the overhead of storing stuff. Uh, you actually uh, want to not duplicate stuff on screen. You want to not duplicate them on memory. So we do a lot of effort to deduplicate resource to actually uh, compress what we can. As I said before, we are limited by memory bandwidth. So we do compress a lot of things. For example, the glyph. We actually do generate the glyph as a bitmap, but then we do compress it into a specific uh, run-length encoding so that when we draw them on screen, it's actually faster. 
And actually, it's indeed faster to do a C decompression of a random length engraving than to do F only once, which is kind of a funny thing to say. Uh, we have, like, we, we are kind of focusing on having ESL portable. So right now, it's working on FreneBuffer, X11, and well on uh, uh, DRM quite well. We have uh, Windows and Mac OS and Super that are, uh, Windows is working okay on software. We have no other accelerator than on Windows. Mac OS is, uh, kind of okay in software, not really working also in hardware. We have a software render that is that has a lot of optimization for all kind of x86 and ARM uh, targets right now. We don't have any optimization for Core PC and it's nobody seems to be using them. I don't know. Uh, and we also still care about GPU, so we have still a lot of optimization on the GPU side. We do prevent, we, we do take care of limiting the switch. So on OpenPL, there is a cost when you change the texture, when you take the sh change the shader and stuff like that. So we make effort to limit that. Uh, we, we do uh, reduce memory overlay also. We use S3PC and EPC1 and EPC2, which are uh, texture compressed uh, when possible. So that also improves performance and battery consumption when you are on a mobile device. So what is a skin graph? Actually, a skin graph is pretty simple. So right here, this is a skin tree, but actually uh, a skin graph is just mostly a, a tree of uh, objects. And when you do the drawing, you go from bottom to up and you draw the widget one after, uh, one after another on top of each other and that draw your skin. The benefit of having a skin graph is actually that you know every primitive that you need to call on your canvas and you know which one you did call on the previous frame. So you have one point of optimization where you can make a difference between the previous frame and the current frame, and you can actually know exactly what did change, and you can also make optimization uh, that are able to, you can reorder your, your OpenPL, um, let's see, let's see. You can reorder your OpenPL uh, call to be sure that they are not switching uh, texture uh, uselessly. You can reorder a lot of things to be sure that effective for the GPU. Also, uh, because you know what was drawn before and what is drawn now, you have a very easy way to check what did change and do partial update. Uh, partial update is something that is just terrific uh, in terms of word consumption and uh, as an optimization. You can just imagine that if you have a blinking cursor on your screen and you are doing an OpenGL application, that application is most likely trying a full screen redraw all time. So it's very inefficient. If you're doing software, it's very easy to have just a small area of the screen that is where the, 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 the cursor is blinking to be updated. Um, OpenPL started to have two extensions to actually support partial update. Uh, not all drivers support it, and yeah, it, it depends on your, on your system. But with some good OpenPL driver, uh, you have that on embedded device, and it's actually something that's really pay off if you compare that to what Android does, which has no skin graph, no partial update, you have like 30% win easily uh, just by that. One of the benefits also is that you know the stacking of the objects, so you can actually not draw the objects that, that have something on top of them. So this does save a lot of memory bandwidth because you don't put useless picture on screen. Uh, that is something that is also very useful when a, a skin graph does allow. If you are using the old way of doing a widget where you were doing a paint event, it's very difficult when you are doing a paint event to actually know what is about you and not draw the area uh, that are actually opaque. Uh, yeah, we can also do the rendering actually in another thread because the skin graph is a representation of the skin. So when we say, okay, draw me the skin, we can just give that skin graph to another thread and that thread will do the rendering. And in the main loop, you can still continue to not change the thread, uh, the same, you can change the skin graph. And when the skin graph has been rendered, we can actually have another skin graph ready to be rendered on screen. So you are, you are able to use a uh, thread much more efficiently if you have a skin graph. Uh, yeah, you can also cache things much more efficiently because you know between the last frame and the current frame what you need. So you can just keep information that are costly to generate and you can close that off only uh, if you know that they are not needed anymore. 
So it does also get a lot of useless work that you do again and again and again if you're doing uh, just index rendering and plain logic. All right, so that's just to show uh, the idea of uh, previous and current frame. So uh, on, on, your on the left, you have the previous frame on the top and the new frame on the bottom. And the idea is when you are going to draw, you, you have the first layer up here at the bottom. And actually the only thing you need to draw if you have a skin graph is this new uh, light blue rectangle. You don't need to draw the dark blue rectangle that is below it. You don't need to draw the shadow. You don't need to draw anything else than this actual uh, blue light rectangle. And that is a massive saving. Uh, most toolkits will not give you that because they have no idea of the stacking uh, logic on your UI. So they will do a full row of the full uh, object stack. They have no choice, basically. With a skin graph, you have a choice and you can do a cutout and just draw what is needed on screen. So that's a big payoff. Uh, that together with uh, partial updates is one of the most important thing for skin graph. But not all skin graph does implement that. Uh, right now, most of the free software implemented skin graph, they just use OpenGL and they reorder the GL and that's it. So the GL command are reordered to be to do less switching and they do a full redraw from bottom to up uh, because that's fast enough compared to what they were doing before. But uh, actually, you can go much further with a uh, skin graph anyway, but mm, they do. So that is the rendering pli pipeline. So right now, we don't have the yellow one. The idea is that in red, it's the main loop, it's the application. So we want to give as much time to the application to do all its mess, and so that you don't, as a toolkit, uh, limit the application. Most applications are actually uh, IO bound. They are not really doing much in terms of computation. They are doing a lot of uh, network. They are doing a lot of uh, disk activity. So they don't really compute a lot of data. Uh, so the Evas render stage that is in light blue is actually where we do compute the list of widgets uh, that, are that need to be redrawn on screen. Uh, we start to basically we do walk the skin graph two times. A first time to see what did change, and a second time to draw it. So the blue, th the blue one is when we actually check what did change, and when we check what did change, we actually can start uh, pre-computing data that we don't have yet. Uh, that is something that we don't do. Uh, that's something we are working on uh, this year: is to do all this uh, prepare stage in a spread in advance. Right now, all the yellow stuff is currently done as we do the drawing. Uh, which is w one of the issues, well, I, I will talk a little bit more about that uh, later on, on on the issue we have with more spread. But the idea is that we are going to try to focus each spread on a very specific uh, workload. Uh, so that, for example, the Evas render stage is very memory bound because we basically walk the tree in all directions. So you have almost only like if and test. You have almost no computation on the CPU side. The yellow one at the opposite will be very CPU bound, CPU bound because you actually are computing some information. And that's where uh, you can easily spread the load on multiple core. Uh, you can't really do anything on multi-core if you are memory bound. If you are memory bound, adding more core is actually going to trash your battery. So you really need to be careful on what you spread on another spread and what you don't. So we are trying to push that to spread. And the drawing actually is mostly uh, memory bound too. So in most operation, we need one core, we are able to saturate the memory bandwidth on drawing. So that is something that is very important because that means that we can, there is only one operation, which is the upscaling and downscaling of image on, on smooth image uh, that is actually needs to be maybe spread on two, maybe three core, but that's it. Uh, otherwise, uh, one core is enough to saturate the memory bandwidth. We don't need more than that. So we need to focus on really be able to identify which workload uh, is memory bound, which one is CPU bound, and to spread the information. And another thing is that we actually do the drawing in a thread, but we push it to it in the main loop. The reason being that uh, we have only one connection to it, and uh, it doesn't work well with spread there uh, because we use still its libs. We don't really use its to be. Uh, 
main reason being that HTTP has no support for OpenGL. So okay. you still have to have a HTTP usage if you, have, uh, if you want to have OpenGL. So maintaining both HLib and HTTP doesn't really pay off for us in this case. Uh, yeah, so one of the main things we learned by doing the screen graph over the year is the main issue is memory bandwidth. If you save memory bandwidth, you stay off. Uh, it's to the point that actually we do have some compression technique on all data of all object itself. And it did provide us, uh, like we saved like 10% of memory and we did get a 5% speed up. Uh, so it's memory bandwidth is the most important thing uh, when you are doing drawing actually. We do see place where vector graphics and uh, image scaling RSA require more CPU, but that's a very limited set of uh, things to do because you don't actually do each frame uh, in image scaling. You scale the image once and you reuse that for all the next frame. So all the, scale, uh, all the CPU bound operation can mostly be cached uh, between uh, two cycles. With vector graphics, when you start to do animation on vector graphics, you lose this benefit and there you need to actually pay compute each for every frame but that's another yeah that's a specific topic and it also does pay off for OpenGL uh, your GPU is also limited by its memory bandwidth so if you are more efficient on memory bandwidth for your GPU your GPU will be faster you may not notice because you are still running at 60 frames per second but actually you will notice on your battery usage your battery usage is going down if you are using something with less memory bandwidth basically uh, that's something also interesting. So we have actually logic in the screen graph and ESL to deduplicate even strings because less, I mean, we at some point we noticed that we had more strings in memory than image because we already did deduplicate image pixel. So the next big thing was strings actually. So we deduplicate strings, we deduplicate image and text. Uh, when I say text, it's glyphs, uh, which is kind of obvious thing to do. We do compress uh, glyph and uh, image. So glyphs are compressed in software and image in GL. It's one of the issue is that it's very difficult to support a lot of compression format in software because you have to add a lot of logic and optimize it for later on to do all this kind of color space. So we don't have the manpower actually to do all kind of color space uh, and compression techniques in software. Uh, we kind of focus on where we see benefit. So as I saw the design uh, earlier, it creates an issue. We have a lot of thread around, and in fact, the CPU and memory frequency on uh, on an embedded device are very important uh, for the battery consumption and for the performance together, which is logic. But the thing is that the kernel is very bad at this. Uh, so also EFL was created like 10 years ago. There was only one core at the time. Uh, maybe some IM server was having two cores. So we started with one, um, with one uh, thread at, uh, and do everything in it. So we are adding more and more thread over time, but we are now limited by the kernel and basically what you can do. Uh, the main issue with the kernel is that the kernel is trying to, to guess what you are doing. It does uh, have no idea that you are actually drawing a frame. It doesn't know what you did. So what it does is that it look at your history and from that, it guess what will be your uh, your need in terms of CPU frequency and how many core you need and stuff like that. But the problem is that with, as I saw before with the pipeline, you start with a IO bound thread, which is the main loop. Then you do a memory bound pass, which will basically the IO bound one can be at the lower frequency. But the memory bound one, you want it to be slightly higher, but you don't want it to be full speed. The yellow one, you actually want to have all core full speed as soon as the yellow one sh show up. But today, uh, because uh, we have only one thread, we have one thread for drawing and one thread for the EVAT render and the main loop, uh, the IO bound and the memory bound are mixed up together. So basically when the kernel figure out that, oh, it was a memory bound pass, I should have pushed the CPU a little bit. Oh, it's too late, it's done. Same thing happens when you do the drawing. When the thread does start for the drawing, it actually figure out it's too late that you should have pushed the CPU uh, to the maximum. And also it does take time for the, the kernel to figure out that it should turn on the core. So actually what happened in that the worst case, it starts to pour up 
the crawl on your phone after the drawing is finished, which is pretty useful. And uh, so also the issue are inside the kernel, they don't, uh, uh, they have two systems to handle the scheduling. You have the task scheduler, you have the CPU idler and the CPU spec. CPU idler turn on and off the core, CPU spec change the frequency and the scheduler move the task between the core. And none of them communicate. So if you move actually a task from one core to another, you lose all history. So you can also, when you turn on and off a CPU, you lose history of all the tasks that are on that CPU. Same thing, I mean, so the kernel has absolutely no clue of what is going on. And it's a very bad situation. So right now, by we have done experimentation of adding more thread, but it actually doesn't pay off. It's getting worse because the kernel is not able to, uh, to do anything there uh, in time. Uh, there is uh, being done uh, by Linao, I think, at the moment, and a bunch of other people on improving the kernel. But basically, uh, we are we have to roll in the feature by being sure that the kernel is ready. And one of the things that we will have to do is actually to help the kernel a little bit. So the kernel is actually never going to be receiving hints from the user space. They don't want the user space to tell them, oh, now I'm starting a memory bound task. Now I'm starting a CPU bound task. They, they, want to, they don't want to do that because they are too afraid of security issue and stuff like that. So even for the main loop, we will maybe have to start the thread right on, on the Evas founder, on the blue, on, on the light blue, uh, on the light blue part. It will maybe be in thread, but that thread will lock the main loop. So the idea is that this will give a chance to the kernel to have uh, an history for that thread and know over time that that part of the thread is actually a memory bound thread. So the idea is to actually have one thread by for each workload, even if they all uh, block the main loop. Because this way we are going to teach the kernel about what we are doing and trying to at least raise the awareness and the interaction on both sides. So that's may also maybe something that you will see in other application where you actually have to, to split your workload so that the kernel will be able to guess what you are doing. Otherwise, on an embedded device, it will be always wrong. So yeah, it's going to take some time to have the kernel fixed and to have also EFL running in this kind of feature. But yeah, that's major issue here. Edge is actually uh, so another very typical uh, EFL uh, library. It's basically one of the children of Edge is Shoot Trick for people that know it uh, from history. Basically, they did uh, uh, get some idea from us, and right now we are getting some ideas from them. So that's the way it goes. So Edge is a way to define the look and layout of all your widgets and application, basically. It used Evas and everything below it to do the drawing, so it only moves ob objects in the scene graph. It doesn't do any drawing per se, it just gives order to the lower layer. Uh, it's quite optimized for the, the time to first train. Uh, there is some very strong requirement from Samsung that the first train application should be displayed in like less than 100 milliseconds or something like that. So if you're, I mean, we all see that on iOS and Unreal, the first application takes a lot of time to start up. So on iOS, they do this tricky animation that makes you think that your application starts faster, but in fact, it's just the animation that makes you think. And we don't do the animation on uh, in Samsung. We are trying to make it fast, actually. We could have just used animation, I guess. Anyway, so yeah. So to give you an idea is both applications here are done with uh, Edge and Elementary and EFL. And this one on the left is the default uh, theme of EFL. And the right one uh, is a home automation uh, application, actually free software. And they have done their own uh, theming to match the user experience they wanted. So it is the same button actually on both screen, uh, just not looking the same actually. And yes, we have a widget set. So basically, Edge himself doesn't provide a button. It doesn't provide list or things like that. It's elementary that use actually Edge and Evas to actually make together widgets, which are 
defining like what a num tree should be, what a button should be, what we expect actually from a toolkit these days. And that's what Enantiase provides. It also provides uh, the abstraction, as I was talking before, for scale factor, uh, which is a reading mission, so that your uh, Elementary application will automatically adapt on your screen uh, properties. So if it's a TV, it will make a big font and make it readable from the far away. But if you have the same resolution on your watch, it will be much smaller because it actually fits uh, better for your reading mission. Uh, it also handles finger size. So the idea is that when you have areas that you can click, you don't want them to be smaller than your finger size. It's kind of obvious to say that, but that's changed from one device to another. So actually everything in the scene does take into account the finger size. And when you change the finger size, it does actually uh, switch uh, the size. Uh, I'm going to go faster now. We do have a lot of uh, other helping library. We do have bindings also for Superscript 11 and JavaScript, Lua, Python, all kind of stuff. So where is it used? Uh, well, the logo kind of tell you where it is, which I don't think you know where that logo is. So that's Tizen. Uh, we do, the first device we did was actually a camera. It was the NX300, uh, which is a Wi-Fi <coughs> camera. It's using EFL. It actu actually doesn't have any GPU. Uh, it's er the UI is full software because this kind of device is focusing on having a very expensive sensor and actually an expensive system on chips, which makes sense. They want to use photos. They don't want to display that much stuff. Uh, we did also all the Samsung gear uh, are actually running on Tizen with Enlightenment and EFL on it. Uh, so right now, I think the latest one is the Gear S. We did uh, the first phone Kunai, which is the Samsung Z1, uh, which is now up for sale in India. And we have uh, announced that all TVs this year will be uh, running on Titan with Enlightenment and EFL. Uh, they were shown at CES, and I think they go on sale on March or April or something like that. So every Samsung TV is going to have Enlightenment. Uh, so over time, there was a lot of other small company and a uh, bigger one that have been experimenting with uh, EFL on, on their device. So we had fridge, printer, we had medical device, set top box, all kind of uh, stuff going on. So where is it going? Well, as you can guess, it's still going to have a lot of uh, improvement in terms of performance. We still have a lot of focus there. Uh, we also are going to try to squeeze it even more down to be able to run on system that doesn't have an MU and stuff like that. Oh, thanks. Um, we also want to improve speed by handle more color space directly with no conversion. Um, yeah, there is a lot going on there. We also are adding some new features that are kind of cool, like we have a 3D screen, screen graph now in e EFL. Uh, we are adding, trying to work on adding SVG and vector graphics in, in EFL. Uh, that should be coming during the year. Uh, we also have animated filter. I will show you that a little bit later on. And we have uh, more portability and uh, yeah. So we what we can do with filter is actually to do bump mapping in real time. So this example is with an image, but you can actually that do that to your on your widget. So you can actually have a bump map on your button and change the source light on your full application. That kind of does silly things, but you can do it. <laughs> We also have screen graph, so I, I will not be able to use the demo because I'm really short on time, but this thing is moving and you see, see the shadow, it's a 3D object. So the idea is that we are doing TV and on TV you have 3D TV, so you want to be able to have 3D icon from time to time. And for 3D icon, we really want to be able to display the screen graph in two different uh, camera angles. So if you don't know if it's a 3D object or not, you are not able to do that. So you actually need to have a 3D screen graph to be able to display uh, 3D image on a 3D TV. So that's why we are rolling on this kind of feature. Uh, we are also working uh, quite hard on making Wayland uh, work. Uh, and that is, uh, the goal is for us to have a release by around June for Enlightenment uh, as a full Wayland competitor without the need for it at all anymore. Uh, we have to, yeah, we have a lot of things going on with Enlightenment. Uh, that is going to be interesting. So, yeah, EFL, we do a release every three months. It's now using Tizen. 
Samsung is pushing uh, a lot of effort in it uh, as a matter of optimization because that's where we quite stay a lot of there. We do, uh, yeah, we do stuff on it basically. And I need to finish. So, <laughs> <laughs> question. I, I, I managed to finish on time. <laughs> that was short. So, yeah, question. Uh, I think we have a micro in the room, no? No, we don't. I will repeat the question. Oh, sorry. In GL? So in OpenGL, to do partial update. Yeah. So how do you do uh, open uh, partial update in OpenGL? So yeah. So to decide to do a partial update, you actually uh, use the buffer age extension, which tell you how old is the buffer you are drawing on. So it tell you if it's like one frame, two frames, three frame, or forever. And with that, you can do a delta. And you estimate on the delta. If the delta is small, you do partial update. If the delta starts to be too big, you do full screen update. So there is a threshold uh, that is actually almost the same for all GPUs. Uh, we did test on um, uh, Intel and uh, Mali and uh, Qualcomm uh, GPU, and they all have the same threshold of where it be <coughs> it's useful to switch to full screen rendering. So, uh, so the time frame for moving to Alien uh, is mostly uh, the main point now is that we are cleaning up our interface. So the binding will have a clean interface to, to use on. And when that's done, all the bindings should be working uh, at that point already. Hopefully in June, <laughs> maybe three months later. Uh, yeah, so does it work on OpenGL ES? It does work on OpenGL ES2 and OpenGL uh, also 2. We have both backend uh, working. Yeah, of course. Yes? So we do have Evas, uh, inside Evas, um, uh, UV coordinates to change the transformation. So it's not matrix based, it's uh, UV based. And you can actually uh, affect the screen graph that way. And we do actually do square uh, updates. So we do a bonding box on, on that area uh, as uh, an update area. Good? Yeah. So the yeah, the basically the, the way we so but the question was about EET if we have how is the big engine and uh, little engine support, and actually we do uh, the we do store everything with uh, network to uh, host to network uh, and we do read everything with uh, network to host, so everything is still in memory and work on both sides, so yeah. So just. One thing, and I have here to state it, uh, Samsung is hiring, uh, not only on, on Lightmount, we are hiring also on Wayland, on Channel, and Jetstreamer, and WebKit, and Blink. And there is post there somewhere where we have all the place we are hiring on. Uh, that's for the open source group. So people like me who do work on upstream first, and who also go around the world to do skinny talks like mine. Yeah, so here it is. Uh, thank you everyone, and I think uh, I am done.